Uh, I think it's important to, to tell my like brief musical journey, which is that I grew up uh, influenced mostly by like mainstream media music, MTV and the radio. I was very into rock and roll and pop music and a little bit of hip hop. And then I went to a music school for four years. And um, upon entry, I realized like, oh my gosh, there's all these people who are really, really serious about music. I went there because I basically wanted to be a rock star and I was recording my own little songs in my basement, starting crappy little bands. And here come these people who, you know, raised by musicians, went to performing arts, high schools, can play circles around me. And there's, you know, you know, 47 genres of music I never heard before that I didn't know anybody cared about or that had any depth. And suddenly, like, I'm confronted with all this stuff. Um, but fortunately, I got really passionate about learning, studying, uh, practicing and got really into all those genres of music and all those facets of music I didn't know about. And that's when I got into electronic music and realized that all the playing video games and learning how to program and writing video games and stuff I dabbled with technologically uh, as a younger person could be used in music. And I was really fascinated by electronic music that, um, that had a lot more intellectual components, song-based stuff or compositionally-based stuff. Music school is a place that's generally very academic and very heady and not so much about the simpler core emotional stuff that pop music and dance music are about. So I got really into like the heady electronic music for a long time. And that's what my, uh, yeah, that part of my life was about. And that's also when I started merging electronic music with live music because my experience was as a guitar player and a singer fronting bands. And um, I thought it was a really fabulous idea, the idea that we could like reverse engineer electronic music, take music that people composed with computers and translate it to live instruments so that it had a more engaging kind of stage presence. And you could see, oh, there's a keyboard player doing synth lines and there's a drummer banging out beats and there's a bass player, you know, um, doing that. So that was my uh, interest for many years. And then eventually I discovered, geez, it's really freaking hard playing in bands. There's all this like social, psychological, scheduling kind of stuff that gets added on top of the like, do we like the same music? Do you like the parts that I'm writing? You know, do you think this is cool? Uh, playing in bands is a really challenging social thing and maybe I don't have the greatest social skills ever, but I've got some good technical chops and uh, strong desire to learn. So I turned away from playing in bands, quit all the bands I was playing in uh, as a side man and a front man and started doing solo electronic performance. And that was largely inspired by Ableton. Um, I got, uh, I think, Ableton version one or two. This is in like 2001. And it was a very, very simple program at that time. But it could do this awesome time stretching stuff in real time. So the ability to like remix a song, you throw a drum loop in, you can throw in any kind of song and uh, beat map it, you know, like drop in markers and stuff. But you'd have like insta remix. And you could swing that tempo knob and, you know, up to like drum and bass tempo or down to house or whatever and that was just kind of mind-blowing for me and I was like this is a really powerful tool this could be you know the kind of DJ tool that I would always wanted um, where I could blend all these different styles of music um, using that time stretching synchronizing technology so um, that's how I got into solo performance and that's as I mentioned earlier where the genesis of controllerism came from um, as I confronted this like performing with controllers I had to figure out ways to explain to people that like this is a live instrument and uh, you know, it triggers sounds, and, and you can modify sounds. And I need better interfaces to do that. That was, that was the big controller epiphany, was like, software is really great at <laughs> everything except connecting with your body. And um, that is what led me to designing instruments, is I was always able to somehow figure a way to use Ableton or Reactor on top of Ableton, or just Ableton as it got more mature, other plugins, uh, MIDI translators, you know, there's a million little software tools you could cobble together. Um, but I didn't find um, hardware instruments that were anything, anything as expressive and like well-made as the guitar, which was my prim primary instrument. It was coming back to guitar um, after doing all that sample-based stuff and just playing controllers for a while where I was like, I really want something more expressive. I don't want, you know, just knobs and buttons to me that felt like a very limited musical interface. So I got into designing instruments and I've been doing that for a good uh, six years ever since I moved to San Francisco, roughly. That's when I finished the mojo.
good idea to smile and laugh when you make a mistake, but not to immediately go to the next section. The best idea is to make the mistake four times and then it sounds totally intentional. It's a great trick. So it's like, I'm here. Right? That's not where I want to go, but... That's the way to do it. This is good though, this is like me practicing for the show tonight, so I'll, I'll remember that one hopefully. Uh, okay, so now you got a little idea of what my performance looks like, and what the music I'm doing now sounds like, and maybe a little bit about how these instruments work. So that leads in more seamlessly to like an actual discussion of what these things do and why. And that's one of the most exciting things to me about uh, controllerism, is this idea of like, we've got these really powerful tools, we've got a whole new uh, vocabulary of sound, you know, as in like, we used to be playing notes, you know? Uh, like that, sort of. And, uh, or, you know, beats or whatever on these very um, acoustic or electroacoustic simple instruments. And now we can press a button and we have a drum loop. Right? And we turn a knob or whatever and the drum loop is modified. Or we press some buttons and all that stuff and that's a whole new vocabulary right that's only been around for I don't know uh, the technology has been around for maybe like 30 or 40 years but it's only been in the hands of like every music making person out there for you know maybe 10 years so let me actually talk about what I've done so this is the mojo and this is what I finished six years ago and this was kind of envisioned more as like the one and only instrument I would play on stage um, it's got this two-handed ergonomic thing, obviously, like um, laying things out so they're shaped like my hands, so it's really easy to grab a fistful of faders. Yeah, the ergonomics make it easy to grab groups of controls and with one hand or with two hands, like do large manipulations. Just ergonomics versus grids, which are more you know, functional, you can shove store more things in a grid, but this is kind of a more human interface. Uh, it's built way tougher. I've actually dropped this thing a number of times, um, but it's, uh, it's held up really well because I got high quality components and it's made out of aluminum and wood and it's easy to replace components if and when they do break. Faders are a thing that just eventually will wear out no matter how awesome they are. Um, but because it's not mass manufactured with printed circuit boards and all that business, you just like open up the box 10 screws, and two screws to take out a fader, cut some wires, solder in a new one, put the screws back in, and you've repaired the thing. So uh, it's got that. And then a big thing was to use a variety of different sensors to make it more expressive. So it's still kind of limited compared to, um, yeah, I don't know, something like, uh, like a traditional instrument, like a guitar or a violin. Um, maybe even limited compared to something like a Leap Motion, which has incredible resolution and tracks all your fingers individually, you know, or something crazy like a Hocken Continuum. Um, but having a variety of sensors, um, you, for one thing, can navigate it much more easily by touch. I never confuse my uh, faders, which control volume, uh, with my knobs, which control effects, right? So it's like the volume feels like a fader, and the effects feel like a knob. So. Uh, they never get confused, and, uh, and that's part of the design, is make all the different functions uh, feel different with tactile feedback. Um, so that's the gist of the design of the Mojo. Uh, the way it's laid out uh, right now for my current project, it's been sort of like modified. This is kind of like Mojo 1.5 or something. You know, so I swapped out some of the buttons, I put lights in it, didn't used to have lights. Uh, and the way it works now for this project is these blue buttons down here control my set and my arrangement. Um, so I'll show you what's going on in the software. So this is the only thing I look at my display for during performance, which is this custom little pop-up display, which is a Max for Live patch that I made with the help of my friend Ryan Chalinor, who's Aubies. I don't know the origin of that Twitter handle, but he's Aubies on Twitter. Help me make this thing, and this basically reads a text file. You can download this for free from my website. Um, uh, it, it reads a text file, which is a set list, and the set list is just like the names of songs, colors for these different little chiclet looking things, and uh, uh, oh, and the scene number. So they all represent scene numbers within my set. So 
If you guys know Ableton, you know like scenes are this great way to organize sounds sort of sequentially over time. So here's the scenes for that song, Plastic. Uh, you don't really need to see the mixer because it fools you into thinking things are happening. They're not. Uh, but there you can see Plastic and the pre-chorus and the chorus and the bridge. So those are four sections of the song. And so what this max patch does is it just says, when I click on this button, plastic, it l remembers the scene number for this scene, which is like 112 or whatever. I figured that out at some point, and that's the only annoying thing. Uh, and then I have four buttons which just trigger that scene, and the next scene, and the following scene, and that. So I have four buttons that just trigger four sections of any song. So I use this thing to organize my sets and go to the last song. Ooh. Uh, this is Cash, and play the first section of that song. And the second section. Uh, so that's how I control song selection and sections within the songs, and then I build arrangements by bringing in layers with my four faders. So I basically have four tracks that more or less represent um, guitars. Drums, bass, and just other stuff, breaks or percussion, or uh, in this song, they got some sound effects, synths and stuff. So to me, that's like my my band, more or less, and I cue, you know, hey, like, let's start this song this time, we started it last time, this time, with that thing, maybe we'll start with the bass this time. You know? Intro is as simple as play that two or four times and bring the drums in. And the next thing, and maybe a little drum fill. Uh, so that's how arrangements get built, is just by layering things. Maybe the next time I come back to that section, I add another layer. And that way, with just this right hand, you know, I can call up any of the sections of my songs, uh, stop the whole thing. Uh, and control the arrangement with this one hand. Uh, and one other cool feature is, um, I didn't use it so much in that song, but I have these buttons that basically punch the faders up to full volume. Just one second. Uh, so that I can do like hits or kicks over time, I think is what they called it in music school. So you've got all this stuff going on uh, and just, you can just tap a button instead of jamming a fader and that way you can either like uh, you can like take a drum beat down to half time. Or you can do the hits. And that just lets you, kind of like that is all this control that I would have with a band more or less. It's a very synthetic and in many ways a limited kind of way, but it's, it's all the same things I would instruct musicians playing with me to do. So this is kind of like my band in a funky little box on a stand in front of me. Uh, the other stuff, there's some customized effects that I would like to redesign because I'm not crazy about them, but there's you know some of these macro smart knob effects on different knobs, and I have some sends. I think in that song at the outro I was using my sends for like a delay and a reverb. So yeah, there's just like uh, an insert effect on these uh, these touch strips, an insert effect on these knobs, and then sends for delay and reverb. So that's my little mixer section. And then over here, I've got these like heavy-handed uh, global effects. So everything gets bussed to um, a new channel. I guess you guys are looking at this. I can show you some more stuff with this. Here's my four tracks. Guitar, drums, bass, miscellaneous. These are all like live tracks and placeholders and stuff. But you can see on my returns, everything goes over here to, I don't know, mixer. This master effects bus. So the drums, you can see right here. So that return D. That's everything except for my drums. So you see the drums don't go there. 
everything else goes there. And so that's where my like big low pass filter on the whole song or stutter edit on the whole song or those kind of effects. And that leave the drums out of it because I, I got to this place of like going really far out with all these effects and doing super like twisted jammy, like really playing this thing as though it was like an expressive instrument and uh, people just wouldn't dance. Some people would be like, whoa, he's doing something really cool. And other people would be like, that sounds terrible. I don't like this. So my splitting the difference between those two is just to leave the drums alone. So, you know, whatever I'm doing, my craziness, uh, at least the beat keeps going. So the controller guitar started as uh, my friends at Novation gave me these little things called dicers. And they made these cool little triangular controllers meant to attach on the corner of a turntable or a CDJ. And um, in the process, they made the smallest com MIDI controller ever. Like, it's really literally like that big. I don't know of any other controllers uh, that small, except for maybe like a hot hand, which is like just an accelerometer, but basically just some buttons in a USB MIDI controller with LEDs. So boom, I'm Velcroing that to different parts of my guitar and just figuring out like, is this that cool at all? Like what would I do with that? And the thing I did with that that was awesome is I signed those buttons to a pitch shifter and I changed uh, the priority of those buttons so that you have a pitch shifter, which I have here. That's my open A string. That's a pitch shifter, and as I hit these four buttons, uh, the pitch shifter goes higher. But if I have two of them down, which is important, the higher one always takes uh, precedence. So like, I can hold down this one, and tap this one, and it jumps between those two. And what's cool about this is that's exactly how guitar strings with frets work, right? When you play this open string, and you tap it here, and you tap it here, doesn't matter what you do down here. Anyway, so that's how these four buttons are programmed. And I did that with that dicer, and that was the thing that clicked. And I was like, that's freaking cool. I don't think I've ever heard those sounds come out of a guitar. Right, so these four buttons. And you can do like a million things, right? Like you can tap one of them. These are just things I do with my right hand. You can do a million things with your left hand, too. So all those sounds, you know, just come out of this automatically because it feels like you're still playing the frets on the guitar. And uh, anyways, that was the idea, the, the, the prototype that won me over. And I was like, this is freaking cool. I should carry this forward. So that moved on through several prototypes. And what you have here is uh, the prototype for the first production model, Robocaster. Robocaster is the name. I wanted it to be like, oh, it's kind of guitarish, kind of techish. So yes, Robocaster is the name. Uh, my friend uh, Ben Lurie at Visionary Instruments helped me uh, realize this, because I don't know a lot about guitar des design. And believe me, guitars are super deep. A lot of things you can do with custom guitars. Um, but this is all made in his shop, uh, CNC cut wood. Um, he's an expert luthier, um, and uh, this is more what I had to do, where I came up with all these uh, choices of different sensors, um, what they're mapped to in software. You can, of course, map them to anything you want. This is just a MIDI controller. Mojo is also just a MIDI controller. You could get one and map it any way you want. Um, but yeah, the choices was like what kind of sensors, where they should go, what they should control. So this is more my doing. This is more visionary instruments, but put them together and you have this really intuitive to play kind of thing. So some of the tricks I came up with are that same thing uh, Drew was interested in, which is um, I have a volume uh, fader. I like faders, faders are pretty cool. Feels like an easier way to do volume swells, but I also have that same button trick, right? So the button just uh, gates the volume on and off. Chords or whatever. Those are super fun. Put touch strips on it. I like doing filters with touch strips. Um, I 
actually I get, I map those to volume too, so you can do the same tappy trick, tapping the button, but tapping the touch strip gives you a filter as well. So you can go like So you get sort of like a wah wah esque thing, but the tapping adds another dimension to it. Um, a joystick which I tried a few different things with, but really it's just coolest to do pitch bend on them. And you can combine that with the buttons if you're feeling fancy. So, I don't know what the heck I'm doing, but it's fun! <laughs> These are the kind of things that inspire me to keep doing this. Uh, oh, and there's accelerometers in it too. So you can go like... I have this generic drum kit um, that I use as a shortcut because like, I don't want to start off production for my song like picking a snare drum or you know, tuning a kick drum. Like, I just want to like, get some groove happening. I want to like, build this thing up into a playable, performable thing as quickly as possible so I can decide, like, is this a cool song or not? Is this going somewhere cool or not? I like the idea of like, throwing out a whole bunch of ideas quickly and critiquing them at some point later, rather than like wrestling over all the details like through the creative process and it taking forever for it to get to some more advanced stage. So I don't know, here's the beat I built around that. This one might have kicks and snares. So you get the idea there. Uh, and similarly, like I have a bunch of, uh, I use, uh, that's a copy of Battery, which is loaded up with a default drum kit. And I have a copy of uh, FM8, which is this cool FM synthesizer. And I don't have any bass lines programmed for this song. But why don't we jump back to that uh, song Plastic I was playing earlier. Right, right. To, to write, I don't have my whole writing set up. My whole composing set up is what I have here with the only addition of like drum pads to play those drum parts on and a keyboard to play these bass line parts on and synthesizer parts on. Otherwise, my, this is my whole composition rig here. Everything you see is what you get. Um, so yeah, super simple bass line. Eventually that evolves into something with like maybe some modulation or I'll write a cooler bass patch, right? So here's a more... Um, pre-chorus. So this one's got some modulation and stuff going on. But the point is, like, I can quickly just, like, throw a bunch of ideas in here. And usually I'll try to do three different ideas, like write three different bass lines, write three different drum grooves, just get the parts in there as quickly as possible, and then step over into performance mode and, like, sing the thing. Uh, play it through one time. Play it for a small audience or whatever. Be like, this is my new tune. It's not really well developed. I hope you guys like it. Um, and that really quickly determines things like, is this cool or not? I don't think the song I was playing for you a minute ago with the, the super one four five kind of guitar thing was that cool. That's why I haven't developed it any further than what you just heard. Um, but this song, Plastic, that I performed earlier, uh, I did think was cool. You know, I played it in that super generic format. And then I said, yes, I want this to be cooler. So, um, so I took uh, one of those generic drum parts have some drums. Alright, so that's the same kick and snare you heard from that other demo. Kick, hat, snare. But I added these little effects. This little ghost snare. These thingies. So that's how I kind of take that, you know, super generic drum part and start to augment it. Sometimes I'll layer additional sounds on top of the kick and the snare to give it more flavor. 
um, with the bass, I think I was already playing this, but you'll see like, this is a super basic bass line. But I'll add some modulation. So it's just like FM modulation depth in the synthesizer to give it more flavor. Um, and then I'll start adding some synth stuff. So, you know, maybe I'll keep, oh, what I love doing is I'll edit guitar parts. So I don't think I have the original, oh yeah. This is kind of the original guitar recording for this. That's more or less, that's kind of what the verse was. So that's where it started. And then to give it more flavor, it became this. And that was just taking this, that original recording over here into session view and just like chopping it up and reversing little bits, you know, stuttering things, um, dropping out, you know, silencing things and reversing things. <laughs> There's just three techniques. You can make a zillion different um, interesting electronic sounding versions of any acoustic instrument. So that's how I got this. That's how I develop a lot of the, the guitar parts to give them more interest. Just basically acoustic guitar that's been edited. So they all start as just acoustic guitar or electric guitar and then I'll edit and mess with them. All these drum parts start as just like a kick snare and hi-hat from a generic drum kit. And then eventually like I'll layer and add new sounds and create new grooves. That one doesn't have a whole lot of ton of different sounds in it, but some of them do. And the bass, I'll add modulation, I'll create different uh, patches. And then, you know, this fourth track is where it's just like anything goes. Um, this is where I'll call up like fancier synthesizers that take lots of CPU and just try out some different counter melodies, sound effects. I think that was a guitar, original. And I mostly just use the tools in Ableton, which are the envelopes and the editing you can do on the other uh, range view over here. And that's, that's it. So all the songs uh, you'll hear, sounds you'll hear me play today and the stuff I'll be playing tonight is exactly that. Like it never went into this digital audio workstation environment where it was, you know, mixed or, or whatever. There, there's a few other cool things going on where I kind of pre-mixed um, that drum kit, right? Like I told you I had a generic drum kit. I did spend a while like carefully picking a snare drum and a kick drum and some hi-hats and, um, uh, and, and the bass sounds. Like I write new bass patches for each song, but check it out. I use the same exact sub bass patch for every single one. Yeah, so that's how I kind of unify the writing and performing process. And uh, the next step with all these songs is actually I am taking them into a separate program a fully crazy featured uh, digital audio workstation called Cubase, and that's where I'm like fleshing these things out to turn it into a recorded album that will survive for all eternity, uh, as we hope recordings will do. Um, and there I have all the tools to do vocal comping and, you know, fancier mixing and that kind of stuff. Uh, cool, so this is really easy to talk about. This is a great example. This is kind of the second generation of the prototyping I was talking about earlier. So with the Robocaster, right, there was Velcroing stuff to a generic guitar just to see if it was cool or not. Then there was taking an old electric guitar that I don't really care about. It's like a $200 beater electric guitar that I brought to Burning Man and halfway destroyed several times. Uh, I sawed off the bottom half of that and just bolted on metal plate and stuck my own controls in there and wired those up to a do-it-yourself MIDI brain and that was the first like real Robocaster prototype. That's where this is. So this also started as uh, like a little Novation Dicer, that little triangular thing, Velcro it on a microphone and I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. I like the ability to just like punctuate my sentences. Uh, so generation one was the the Dicer, right? Generation 2 was a Nintendo original NES, Nintendo Entertainment System gamepad that I wired up 
Um, because it was smaller and it looks really cool and it's got this retro vibe that I like a lot. But the buttons are way too small. So this is the third generation. Uh, oh, also like it was just wobbly. Like so, this is the like over-engineered third generation where it's like you use the huge, burly, indestructible arcade buttons from the Mojo that I like so much. That's what all the buttons are. Uh, arrange them super ergonomically. So you got these same arcs of buttons that I have on the Mojo, that I have on the Robocaster, you know, for the pitch shifters I was showing you earlier. Um, and then the added thing is it's built into a big clip. This is just like a big heavy metal clip that came out of like a lighting catalog or something. And the reason for that was I wanted to really decide like, I'm not sure where this thing goes. Like with the Robocaster it was obvious, you know, like where I wanted the controls for the effects. Um, but I wanted effects on my microphone and I couldn't decide, you know, <laughs> which is so, the vocals are the hardest for me because like I'm not, I've not been doing vocals for very long. It's kind of like new for this project. I didn't sing on my last project. And so suddenly I'm a vocalist, suddenly I'm cast in this whole different light, and suddenly I've got this new instrument, the microphone. And the microphone is a weird thing because it could be in a stand in front of you and I could be doing, doing stuff in my hands that has nothing to do with it, or that has everything to do with it. Uh, it could be um, on the mic stand but I still rock the mic and I get to walk around and like point at people and be like, what you doing on your phone, man? Yeah. And then come back to the mic stand, much like a guitar player would come back to his pedals to execute something. There's a million, million things you can do. Oh my goodness. Or it could be strapped to my head like the Britney Spears S pop stars do. And then I wouldn't have to worry about any of this stuff. <sighs> what are you going to do? So the clip was part of figuring that out. So at least I could figure out like, how, do I, how does it feel to have it clipped on the stand? How does it feel to have it clipped on the mic? So this gives me a little more portability to walk around and continue to rock. <laughs> so this is the microphone controller. And um, I went with just buttons because <laughs> if I had more, if I had as much experience, I've spent thousands and thousands of hours playing guitar, not so much with vocals. Didn't grow up singing at home or anywhere else. It's kind of something I've come to late in life. So it takes me a lot of focus just to like hit pitches and get timings accurately, more or less. And I didn't, you know, I wanted to use auto-tune. I didn't want to sing with backing tracks or lip sync or any of that crap. Um, I'd rather just sing poorly, but maybe I'll augment with what I do with what I can do, which is like mess with effects. And let's keep the effects simple so that I'm not trying to like move a touch strip with my index finger and like wiggle a joystick with my thumb while I'm trying to hit those pitches and timing accurately. So all I've got is momentary buttons that trigger effects like delay, 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 delay. reverb, uh, distortion. <laughs> hey, uh, oh no. I think I broke my thing. Oh no. Well that's unfortunate. Hello, my hello. Oh, there he goes. Oh, malfunction. Uh, I think we need to replace some wiring. Uh, <laughs> distortion, it's like a lo-fi downsampling kind of thing. This is a gating kind of thing. This is a good old beat repeat, stuttering beat repeat. Hey, I'm at the producer's forum. And the coolest thing I think is harmonies. Because I got into all this like, you know, what kind of vocal effects do I really like? And I just love vocal harmonies. When you hear human voices stacked in harmonies that move with the harmony in the, in the song, like, it's so powerful. Um, and so, you know, I had friends who do that, they'll, like, pre-record all the harmony vocals, so they're singing a lead vocal on top of that. And I tried that, but then it was, like, it felt restricting. It felt a little bit like karaoke. Like, if I suddenly drop the mic or something stops working, you know, the harmony vocals keep going and there's a big disconnect, you know, like, both for me and for an audience. Uh, I didn't like that, so a good comp but I, you know, but yeah, so a good compromise I came to was using a plugin that harmonizes your voice. You send it MIDI notes, and it creates a harmony at whatever notes you send it to. Um, so for this song, well, I'll show you. Let's go to that song I was playing. Just keep using the same one. So in the chorus. It doesn't matter what I'm singing. I can be like, totally out of tune or whatever, but I've got these MIDI notes playing harmonies. And we actually do say something intelligent. It sounds kind of cool. Plastic, plastic smile, fake 
plastic smile. So they're doing a thing. It's kind of interesting. And uh, that to me is my favorite effect. So it's really just muting, uh, sorry, unmuting a MIDI clip that's triggering vocal harmonies, you know, and they'll do different things. Different sections will have a whole different things going on. This is the hey. Oh, we got to a different song. Uh, anyways, you get the idea. So this song, hey. Oh, uh, <laughs> not doing a great demo of this. Uh, it'd be easier for me to just like play part of a little tune. Um, this is what I might open up my set with tonight, depending on what happens before me. Ho, ho, ho. A cold December, the coldest I remember. Walk to the river I used to ride on. The sun's gone down to make room for night. I sit on my blanket and pray to the land. I choose the end. I choose out. I choose when I choose now. So to me that felt cool because I can change my phrasing, I can change my lyrics, I can do more improvisatory things, and the harmonies just kind of come in as an added layer, kind of like a vote. You could do the same thing with a vocoder or you know a talk box. You know, there's many ways you could. Uh, do a similar thing. So that is the vocal controller, soon to hopefully morph into a new generation that is a little less bulky. The conclusion I came to is like for writing material, it doesn't really matter too much, you know, the sound quality, the fine nuances of the performance, right? Because you're just like getting the ideas out there to critique the ideas, pick that melody versus this melody, you know, pick that guitar part versus this guitar part. Doesn't really matter what microphone you use. And similar for live performance, I mean, I love good sound, well-produced music, um, but there's, there's this definite you know, balance in live music of like the more live it is and the more that really is happening on stage and can go wrong and mistakes that can happen, like the more um, the, uh, the sound qualities and the, the nuances of, of that are gonna suffer, right? Like you'll never have uh, an electric, a good way to explain it. It's just like you can never, you know, hitting play on a pristinely produced, carefully recorded track is always going to sound better than you trying to play those parts live, a bunch of people playing those parts live, even the same hardware synthesizers hooked up, you know, like you, you can just do so much more in a studio environment to tweak things to perfection that you're always going to wind up with better like sonic uh, results. But the cool thing is, is in live performance, often that is not what the audience cares the most about. I mean, maybe you've got audiophiles in your audience, maybe you've got an amazing sound system, and that really does count. Um, but I go to a lot of shows, um, and you know, with the kind of music that this is, which is vocal kind of pop music, um, people are interested in things like, what are the lyrics? What's the song about? Like, what is the singer doing with their hands? You know, if you go see like a pop show, it's all about like dance moves and like. You know, there's a lot of that in there. And, and even with the EDM stuff, like, there's this whole, like, I mean, not to encapsulate or, um, <laughs> Jody's got it. Uh, not to, like, uh, what do you call it? Stereotype, uh, you know, a whole thing, but I see a lot of DJs doing what I would consider interpretive dance, which is cool. They're, like, kind of helping the audience, you know, know when to clap or dance or make noise, and that's cool, but it's not so much. <laughs> what? That's not what I like to do to perform live music, uh, you know, to play a show. But then they augment that with like fireworks, with pyrotechnics, and there's something to that too, right? Like you don't go to a fireworks show, and you're not like, where's the guy controlling it? What kind of controller does the guy with the fireworks have? You know, like, oh, what's his, 
what's his computer to firework interface? They, <laughs> no, you're watching this thing that's obviously like pre-programmed. I mean, maybe there's a little bit of control, but nobody's watching the person do that. And no, nobody questions that ever, right? So to me, that's kind of what's happening in the like mega star DJ uh, realm right now, is it's more about lasers and projection mapping and that kind of stuff than like humans making sound with things. And that's okay too, but um, what's the whole thing I'm getting to here? Oh, is uh, I'm very interested in the dynamic of the stage show and connecting with other people in, um, in kind of a visual way as well as an auditory way. And the most important thing for me as, as I design my whole performance aesthetic is, is for audiences to understand what's going on and for there not to be this veil of like mystery you know, where they, they can't figure it out by watching me what I'm doing. I try to make it very visual, make everything very simple. There's no complex interactions between these instruments. I press buttons on my mic, and the sound of my mic changes. I press buttons on my guitar, and the sound of my guitar changes. And that makes it really intuitive for me to play and also for audiences to watch. And that's kind of like my performance stage ethic. And getting back to the sound quality thing, uh, so I don't worry too much about how will I sing the thing, or how accurate my guitar solo is, or how well mixed my backing tracks are. I'm worrying about that now in the studio with Cubase because I'm producing a record. And that's where I'm like really careful about microphone selection and placement if I'm recording an acoustic guitar. And just much more, you know, uh, doing all the studio perfection kind of stuff. So I, I could talk about that stuff too, but really that's not where most of my knowledge lies. And that's me doing stuff that. A lot of other people do better, frankly, like people who are serious about engineering and production. Um, um, and I love, I love those things, but um, I'm not as awesome as them as probably some other producers you've had here at the forum. I think there isn't a paraphrase of this again for the recording. So it's basically like, how do you, geez, how do you live life as an artist? And I think I paraphrased it in the outline as something as like money versus art or something like that. Um, those two are two things that I think are kind of diametrically, I don't know what diametrically really means, but I think they're diametrically opposed things. Um, in that, um, yeah, art is something you do kind of, I think, um, for the pure joy of creative expression. And money is the reality of the world in which we live. It's this system of exchanging uh, goods and services. So we can have an orderly society in which people are rewarded for their good efforts to benefit society. So those are two ideals. They never quite play out exactly that way. And a lot of people like myself have this dream of like, I want to do something very artistic. I want to do something very creative, something that expresses you know, my thoughts and ideas and emotions um, and somehow make money doing it. And that has been my quest for my entire life. And that's why I call myself an artist. And other people are trying to do that too. It's definitely not for everybody because some people don't feel, I think, this need to express themselves that way, like publicly. Some people are like, no, I just want to like, you know, like my mom's a nurse. She spent most of her life, you know, just helping people, um, you know, have babies and, and manage pain and stuff like that. And that's a pretty direct, easy way to like, well, not easy, but it's a way to be helpful in the world. Um, I don't know, I felt myself called to the creative stuff. And it's been a long, long process of kind of uh, getting to do more of what I want. And <laughs> such a broad question, it's tough to answer. Um, but I'll tell, I'll tell a, maybe a more biographical version of it, that might be helpful. So I went to music school and I spent all this time and all this money studying music. and. When I got out, there was no money waiting for me. There was no job or anything like that. And there was nobody who could advise me as to like what to do, you know, now that I have this music education or whatever. So I actually didn't get to do much music to make money. I made a little bit of money while I was still at school uh, writing music for television. I had impressed a bunch of, um, a bunch of the, the teachers at that school with how well I could uh, produce music, electronic music quickly. So I started working for a uh, publisher who would place music in television. And she'd be like, I need a Sneaker Pimps track by Thursday. Can you do something like Sneaker Pimps? And I'd have like three days to like write and produce a vocalist and a complete track to sound something like Sneaker Pimps. And then it would get placed in a television show and I'd make some money. And that was kind of the first thing I ever did that made money um, 
that felt like it was in music. Um, for a long time, I did all these things that didn't really feel like music, like I was a, a, a theater electrician hanging lights um, in New York City and did a little web page design. And then I had some things that were kind of in music but felt really not fun, like transcribing uh, Led Zeppelin songs to become ringtones for early cell phones. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what were some, <laughs> some other whack gigs? Oh, DJing at a shoe store <laughs> in Times Square, because that's how you roll at the Skechers in Times Square. You're like, it's a DJ. I'm going to buy some shoes. This is cool. And I was that DJ. Uh, I never liked it very much, but I did it. And um, anyway, so you know, I kind of worked up this, 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 this thing, and I'm still working up it. You know, I really love doing the kind of thing I'm going to do tonight. It's exceptional that I get to play a show for a really educated audience. I mean, not everybody there is like a music geek like I am, but there's gonna be a whole bunch of people at this show that understand what live PA is and understand what controllerism is and can totally appreciate the difference between what I'm gonna do and, you know, interpretive dance. <laughs> They're gonna understand <laughs> that, oh, this is a real guitar solo that's happening right now. Oh, he's really singing all those notes. Um, there is no auto-tune. Um, and they're going to appreciate that. That's not the case um, with a lot of audiences. It's a pretty exceptional thing that's happening tonight. And that's part of why I'm frankly not making my living just playing parties and like thrilling audiences everywhere. I know people who are doing that, and they make other compromises. Um, you know, they play music um, that's like better for rock and parties, like dance music. I have a buddy who's a bass player in like a live house band. Um, they're amazing dance music, it's a live three-piece thing, and they do really well. And uh, yeah, they're mostly touring and performing, and I think that's amazing. And I would have gotten to that place um, where I'm still trying to get, where that's most of my livelihood sooner, but I chose more of the create creative stuff. Like, I, when it came to writing electronic music, like, I wasn't super inspired um, by dance music, I wasn't super inspired by pop music, I was inspired by IDM. And it's probably tough to make a living as a touring IDM artist. I don't know that many uh, artists that, that do it. Um, so I think it's fortunate now that I've gone back towards the like pop rock kind of stuff. And I think there will be more interest in my shows. So that's kind of a backwards biographical answer to the, the question. But it's like I'm still not there where you know I'm. There, there's always something new to learn. <laughs> There's something, some other cooler toy that somebody else has that I want to play with. Um, something else to learn. I guess that's what's always motivating it, is um, I want to learn something new, and that forces myself to, to keep changing what I do and challenging myself. And, jeez. So I've kind of given you the explanation of why I'm not making money playing, uh, why I'm not making a living make, playing shows, and it's because I got super interested in all this other stuff, which I think is really exciting and interesting. And, and just led to, to more livelihood. So making the instruments. Originally, like I made the mojo just as a way for me to have a better instrument to perform. And then I started touring around and performing more, and people started saying, that thing's awesome, I've never seen anything like it. Where can I get one? How can I get one? How much, like you said, how much do you want for that thing? That was a legit question, and there were people who were ready to throw down a whole bunch of cash. And, not so much for like, I want your money, but more for like, I would really like for more people to have this instrument. I'm not doing this because I want to like glorify my ego and be the one guy who has the one mojo and it is like Excalibur and I rule the universe. <laughs> I think it would be a better world if more people had these things and more people could, you know, not have to learn all the technical things I had to learn to, to, to make this. So I wanted to make it something that could be duplicated. So I made it. Uh, a for sale instrument with 60 works controllers and spent a whole lot of time, you know, kind of making controllers, which isn't exactly what I wanted to do, but it helped me earn money at that point in my life. And that led to, wow, I want a new cool guitar. And so I started doing that. And that led to the guitar wing thing. And that's been part of my livelihood this year is, is helping live at instruments with the guitar wing and so many other things, like what I'm doing right here today. Not every performer, producer, artist, whatever I am. Um, would do a workshop like this. I don't know why. They probably have their great reasons. But I love doing this because um, I, the most important people uh, who've had the biggest positive influences in my life who haven't been like, 
you know, in my family or in relationships with me have been, uh, close relationships have been my teachers. I think teaching is probably the most valuable thing any of us can do as human beings. And um, I don't choose teaching as a profession because it's freaking hard. And it's really hard for me to tie that to, um, to doing what I love, which is um, traveling and, and playing and writing. Um, so it is easy for me to tie it to what's happening right here and now, which is like I get to play this amazing show tonight and I spend um, my daytime um, hopefully helping you guys learn something and I learn something in the process too. And so this is yet another example of, of how it all works. And it's just basically a big lifelong hustle um, trying to merge you know, what I want to do, what I think I want to do, what I want to learn, what I'm, you know, willing to, uh, uh, to get myself to do, <laughs> and what the world seems to appreciate, and what the world um, will give back to me for, and that's, you know, so the money is kind of like the world telling me, like, yeah, this is great, we, we appreciate this, we want you to do that, uh, this, this is helpful for us, and the art is kind of like me figuring out <laughs> what... <laughs> What can I do for you guys that hasn't already been done by somebody else or, you know, could be done better by somebody else? So that's when I think it comes to things like this. Like, I, I'm still super psyched about this. If I was at home right now, I might be building the next one of these because I'm going to play the show tonight and it'll be great. But at some point in that show, I may have the thought like, oh, I really want the one that, you know, is... I could explain what's going to be cooler about the next one. Basically, I want a cooler one of those, and I know how to make it. I just need the time. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, that's, that's the art. That's the money. Always in conflict in one way, and hopefully finding harmony in another way.